Didn't the other kids tell you not to come here? Go back, 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 go back. At the heart of horror, there has always been more than spooks and scares. Sometimes, it's not what you see, but what you hear. Welcome to Sound Scary. Each week, we talk to the artists, the musicians, the fans, the people who haunt the shadowy corners of your mind. Join us as we delve into the deepest, darkest, and most unforgettable earscapes. Welcome to Sound Scary. Welcome to another episode of Sound Scary Quarantine Edition. I'm your host, Ryan Coltrera. And I am James Oster, and we are here with one of the coolest guys in the world. I love this guy. I love him so much. Uh, he's a uh, he, he saw. We're talking The Collector. We're talking all, all these amazing movies. We're talking Pilgrim, Marcus Dunstan. Bravo. Thank you for coming. <laughs> <laughs> Thanksgiving for having me. We're filming this episode shortly before Thanksgiving, and I absolutely got to talk to you about Pilgrim. Like, yeah. my girlfriend and I discovered this film last year after complaining that there wasn't a whole lot of Thanksgiving horror. And like, man, did you scratch that itch. Like, we're legitimately making it a tr like a tradition for us. Like, every year, Thanksgiving, we're going to watch Pilgrim. Oh, mm -hmm. well, thank you very much. Dude, oh, that, I mean, that's Noah Feinberg, man. His, uh, he wrote that story, and it was, I just love that it was based on a true story. Like the, we, we need to get into that. Like, yes. I saw that in the credits. In what way is that based in a true story? So, the last image is a slow zoom in on Noah and the pilgrim behind him. So his mother, because his mom then was at uh, the art, we had a little premiere for it. Mm -hmm. And it was so cool. So it was Noah's first movie. So Noah works at Blumhouse. Mm. You know, his, mm. and uh, the first, one of the first times I met him, he had a stack of novels on his desk by Daniel Krause. I went to college with Dan. He got me a job as a projectionist in Iowa City, Iowa. Mm. So I'm like, dude, are, are you you're reading Dan Krause? Like, he's freaking awesome. And, and it's, you know, then it's like, yeah, you have to go into the meeting now, sir. He's like, oh, yeah, great. <laughs> and then, you know, he delivers, and I, I want to build up the, the legend of Noah because he cranked that screenplay out so quickly and it had all the great stuff that's in there. I mean, we we came in and added a few bells and whistles and maybe just a little bit of uh, horror movie language to deviate from the, the true, some true story parts here and there. Mm -hmm. And in terms of the third act, of course that actually didn't happen, but <laughs> I've been- What? I've been dying to get a Peaches song in a movie and wouldn't you know, it's this one that finally got uh, Peaches in a combination with, uh, uh, oh, Planning to Rock. They, mm. They've collaborated on some tracks. Holy cow, and we were able to get it uh, through, nice. the, through just the grace and power of uh, the good old fashioned Blumhouse. I mean, really, that, that was really awesome. So Noah, that last photo is absolutely true. His mom oh hired a, uh, an actor to come instill the lessons of Thanksgiving. And it was like every, a couple of families, I think in town or a few families in town hosted a performer. Only hmm. the one the Feinbergs received never broke character the entire time he was there. <laughs> and that oh slow zoom in where he's kind of got the, you know, early album Metallica eyes. <laughs> and <laughs> it's so, from the mom and oh dad's God. point of view at the time, or you know, whoever was uh, in witness, it was probably like, oh, this is exactly what we paid for. But imagine being the kid looking up at this dude <laughs> who's got, you know, who's messed out. Like, you want to know what, how you take some lands? And you're like, ah! <laughs> <laughs> That's insane. Oh and my I, God. Yep. And it was really like, uh, Into the Dark was a, it was an absolute resuscitation uh, uh, for me in terms of like, I just never had worked with such an amazing mm. crew and cast and that they understood the language of how these movies were made so much so that I it was it was nice to I just had to listen wow. I just had to listen to what Noah was trying to say mm -hmm. 
just had to listen to the rhythm of, of the pace that it had to be. And I'd had a few chances to cut my teeth on things that never had enough of a budget or enough time. But the, the amazing thing about uh, Lauren Downey and Alex Kernay, these are the two producers, mm -hmm. never wanted for a thing. Hmm. Could finish early, could get the extra shot. And it's, it's like, a, that's when you know you've got amazing producers. Like, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. let us know what you need and we'll figure out the best how. And then in exchange, I would just have to listen to be like, so in the end, when the house should explode, they'd be, no, now we can't, no. <laughs> Can't blow up the house, but we can raise hell this big. And he'd be like, got it. Okay, then we'll raise hell that big. <laughs> and and you did. You and do? Well, well, the other thing is, and this is a, another credit to those two producers. So there were some, there's some moments in that last fight, in particular, using Kerr Smith's head as a headbutt weapon. Because I was like, if, I, if there was a severed head near me, why would I risk my own consciousness when I can mm -hmm. already... Yeah, you know, this person's not using theirs. Use that. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> and that it was nixed. It was nixed in the screenplay stage. Like, no, that is too over the top. Mm -hmm. So, thank goodness, we already had the head. We're like, all right, let's. So we'd have like a little rogue script where the extreme beats. We could sneak back in, and just shoot them, and mm. now as soon as they were seen you kind of had to earn the, the savagery of the horror so it wouldn't come off. A written word, toneless, without music and whatnot, can, uh -huh. yeah, I'm sure that read so over the top, like, are you kidding me? We're trying to instill a tap on the wrist about, you know, ha wanting too much, or like, what if somebody could hear your most uh, base desires, wishes that were a little nastier to your family on Thanksgiving, right? Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. the, in that the, the true lesson is, why are we celebrating the great taking of another civilization? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Pilgrim, all the love. I love this movie. What are some other films that, you know, kind of take characters and kind of twist them around and not present them in the typical way that you dig and that, that have influenced you in some way? Well, no, no, Feinberg's script for Pilgrim was an eye opener and, and a galvanizing force because it could have been a siege movie in a house with people wearing costumes, but it wasn't. It mm -hmm. was saying something more. It was trying to poke holes in our Norman Rockwell version of this gathering and what's beneath the gathering. Now on the surface, getting together with friends and family and loved ones and, and sharing time is, is, is marvelous. But the origin story of, so where'd you have that first dinner? And you just you just stayed there. They were like, "Sure, take whatever you want." Oh no, you took whatever you wanted. You didn't you didn't ask. Oh, and now you're trying to tell us in that period garb that we're on the right path, huh? Okay, got it. <laughs> and then I, it, 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 there was something more in the brain pan than the stimulus that would that would feed heart. It, it there was some thinking and a and there was a a hidden conversation happening in the action, the violence, the threat that had that was rooted in history, a violent, brutal history. Now, repurposed and packaged with tinsel and, and served with a side of gravy. Mmm, -hmm. tasty. What are <laughs> some, and what are some other influences for you for uh, that? Well, my goodness. I, uh, it's odd which sometimes certain things will speak to, hey, I want to try this in this project or bring this type of filmmaking. And oddly enough, uh, I wanted to exploit the feeling I had during an episode of Miami Vice with Pilgrim. <laughs> Interesting. And I, so, so, like, if, if you're a, a filmmaker, producer, writer, you know, whichever, and you were like, I want this to be like seven. Okay, but do you have $35 million, Brad Pitt, Morgan Freeman, and David Fincher? Then what are you doing? What is something that is in your yard? Meaning, like, what's the best example of the two million and under? And what, and you'll often find that it was a creative choice, an original character, a something, it didn't something that could equally compete with spectacle, and that is something to say, a, a, a means of depicting it. And so Miami Vice did an episode where it was essentially like a mini TV safe version of the movie Manhunter. Manhunter had come out, and then this was like Don Johnson playing William Peterson in Manhunter for one hour, trying to catch a guy who heretofore had only broken into a series of homes, covered himself in flour, and smelled people's meat. 
But it was just weird enough where Don Johnson's starting to catch the link and the psychosis of the guy. And it's got a genuine pair of jump scares that are just awesome. Hmm. And I was like, well, now they had a TV schedule. They had, I knew the type of camera, I knew the type of, of filmmaking and the coverage and everything. And it was like, well, we can achieve that. So what else can we say with Pilgrim visually that that gives us respectful uh, footing in the in the schedule and the in the equipment that we'll have at our disposal. So we're not needing to get it in one, but we have enough time to really craft moments that'll that'll earn their own uh, piece of real estate. On, on. And I like it when uh, just to bridge further when you're seeing and learning other types of things from movies. Like I think one of the best examples is I knew the kinetic energy of a cops and robbers show kept me watching To Live and Die in L.A but I kept going back because I felt like I was learning something. And I actually was. You're learning how those particular characters learned how to make uh, fake paper, make mm. uh, counterfeit cash. And, and there was something that was, it had more going for it. And then in this, the sports movies, for example, that have been wonderfully digestible as comfort food, even more so than a great Thanksgiving meal, watching something comforting now during a, a time where I wish I was with my parents, but it's not safe for us to be together. Well, I've been watching movies that I saw with them. So I rewatched Hoosiers, I rewatched Moneyball, I'll rewatch uh, or just the most raunchy of comedies. God, I love rewatching old school. And, and <laughs> you're like, that they're, yes, they're movies that even old school could be considered, it, it builds up to like a sporting event finale. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not about that. It's about can we say can we say goodbye to our reckless abandoned youth and still maintain the kid inside? Can we still can we still be a rapscallion and a responsible person, parent, guardian, etc.? Um, and I, I think that's some of the best movies do that. They they talk to you on a couple different levels. You know, Marcus, I've uh, you know I was watching. A, I actually watched The Neighbor last night. What I like okay, about the right one because there's like eight movies named The Neighbor, Les Neighbors, <laughs> Neighbors Two, Neighbor, Neighbor, Nobber, and we're like, <laughs> I will never miss yours because you always look. What I like about you is you use these actors. Uh, Josh is so good in everything you do. Mm. Everything you do. Well, that's not only. I mean, that's that's him. I just, I, I hope I'm him when I grow up. Right? Yeah. That, that, that dude is badass. I yeah. mean, the, what what makes him such a uniquely because he's 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 got the character thing down, but he's also he's also got the looks. He's got everything. He's perfect. What what makes him the right guy for you? Oh my goodness! Um, shorthand, really. I mean, and really, his his he laughs, and he's a friend, and he's a father. And uh, he's and he's a wonderful husband. So it's like you've got someone who has a life and appreciation for nature and fly fishing and isn't. If it, he's he's one of those rare folks that doesn't need all the all the lights, doesn't need all the the attention, so to speak. He's there uh, to participate with the story, and he's also an accomplished producer and director. So it's kind of neat. Like that's why I, it took directing for me to actually not. Uh, be angsty on a set. I was like, "Oof! I don't have to do that." Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. You control fire today. <laughs> kind of neat. So then, I know that I can look over at Josh. What I if the clock's breathing down my neck, and then he'll just give a little wink, like, "Yep, yeah, not my problem." Like, <laughs> wow. He got, he's also a a a, a two take actor. He does it perfectly the first time. You get a second one to make sure it's in focus and. You're fine. That's rare. Right on. But I, th those are the ones I hold near and dear. Is like, uh, same with Emma Fitzpatrick, same with Alex Esso, same with, uh, oh, and then, dude, Luke uh, Luke Edwards and Ronnie Blevins, uh, Peter Giles, Rain Edwards, like, mm. Taj Spates is this kid I want to blow up if I can. Um, I hired him myself to be in the, the next Collector movie. There wasn't enough in the budget to bring out another L.A.-based actor, so I was like, then I'm, how much, you know, take mm -hmm. it. Uh, nice. And I hope we get to finish his friggin' roll. That'd be great. Uh, <laughs> oh, oh, man. Yeah, well, how, how, how far are you along with the collect? Because this movie looks, I cannot wait for this film. Yeah, oh, what can you tell you. us about the new one? Uh, well, the nice thing about what I learned from John Gulliger was if you're making a schedule, 
ideally you put the most ambitious scene at the top. And at first that would seem like an anti-verse of like, why would you do that? Well, it allows the rest of your production to hone it, hone it, hone it. The most important, that could be the, maybe it's one in the beginning as it was with uh, Feast, but in our case, it was all about the finale. And like I'd learned the hard way during the shooting of the second one that you got, I mean, really you gotta, it's all about the finale in, the, in that one. And in this one, we had eight days of facilitating the end. So the first eight days of photography was all the finale and then backing further and de-escalating, even though the violence was always, always getting bigger. Mm-hmm. So on day one, when you've got fire, dogs, shotguns, knives, you know, all the cast, everything, mm-hmm. it allows you to then de-stress, decompress, and you're now protecting and shaping this movie. Because that's that ending you really want the insert so it kind of feels uh, as intense as the first one has some of this the spectacle of the second but also feels like completing a circle. So the, the arcs that began however many years ago 10 11 years ago will have a natural way to come to a close. Mm-hmm. How much do you th- how much you think is left to do to, yeah. to actual shooting? I I think you know if we shot 8 days I think another 25 or do. Mm. Wow. Wow. This one is it just needs it. Like we, we don't like we don't have to experiment anymore. Like I know how many cuts it takes to sell this gag. If we're doing a trap oriented gag or a mechanism spring kill, that simply requires two angles, three setups. So you have it. So you can tell the math with it. And then another pass uh to give spatial relation. And then those last inserts will be make sure what isn't there in uh an unblinking fashion. The performance and all the choreography has to. I, I'm speaking in like three tongues right now, but <laughs> yes, like I just I know how to put this soup together. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, clearly. <laughs> well, yeah. you've done. You did pretty great with the first two, so you oh, know I, yeah. I I'm I'm on yeah. board of what, what. I just rewatched those as well. Like those movies are such a blast. I'm really excited for this new one because it's like it's not. It took a long time to even sit with Josh, sit with Emma, and sit with those characters and be like, well, what's new? What is not just a repeat beat? Mm-hmm. And then, ah, you know what none of these movies have ever been able to take advantage of is what time has done to the characters in this timeline. So mm-hmm. if you are a victor in one story and a victim in another, how are you? I mean, what's the most realistic approach to how you'd be now? What's your alchemy now that the boogeyman, your boogeyman's still out there? Uh, will his demise be the only thing that stops you shaking at night? Or are you a shattered thing? Mm. Just one of those things out there that you never know what's going to complete it or if it'll ever recede. So it's like, okay. And it's, it's also about like in the first two installments, you know, Josh is a thief who's got nothing, who the nobility is, I will steal something to provide. Mm-hmm. Now, as we, it, now as we find him in this one, he has things to protect. He has things that he can lose. And that's that's the other side of that coin where now, am I fast enough? I, I, I can always look out for myself, but my kid, my dad, my wife, the dog, like all these things are like, whoa, his, his vulnerability is just quintupled. Now, how much does Josh have to say in, in what, what goes down with the, when you're writing the script? How much does he go, hey, maybe I want to do this or maybe I want to do that? Uh, he can, but when it comes to him, uh, really anybody that that I'm fortunate to work with, he can say anything because it's. If you take a note from somebody that really knows that character and has lived in it, they're right. I don't need to hear that one three times. Like, mm. I know he'll know what to do with any scene. So if he has an idea for one, I, I I'm as an I'm an excited audience member to see. Oh yeah, then let's see what would happen if that if we did that. Great. And it's just, it's just a nice, I think it's a nice conversation to keep a character relevant, fresh, growing. Mm. Now, I want to, I want to pivot a little bit. Um, sure. Just because one of the things I've noticed a kind of through line in all your films is you make really good musical choices. And we're, we're a show about, you know, the, the audio of horror and you're wearing a Nine Inch Nails shirt. I want to talk about your musical influences. Like, okay. what are some of the, the bands that kind of influence you creatively? Well, my goodness, uh, starting with the first opportunity, the, the collector was Jerome Dillon. And I first had heard Jerome's drumming on Nine Inch Nails, you know. And so it was like performer by performer. That's how I was able to meet Danny Lohner. 
and and these great guys that would come in and or Robert Sarzo or uh, wonderful artists that would come in and contribute a piece or a section of music and then when I heard uh, and I didn't even get to meet these guys but a couple of uh, fellows from Alice in Chains contributed some guitar riffs for a later track mm. they're like whoa this is awesome and then, <laughs> thank goodness Mickey Liddell who rescued uh, the collector from uh, oblivion and, and gave it, you know, all the spit and polish also provided for the soundtrack. So then we mm. had Bauhaus. So then we had Depeche Mode. So then we had um, uh, Beast by Nico Vega. Then we had, I mean, it was just, it changed everything. But then I, I always, as a spine, had my friend Andrew Reed, his band's uh, name was Patient 113. He scored individual tiny songs, like things that were sometimes only 30 seconds in length for a scene. And so I, I at least had a place to back into if need be. And then the stuff Jerome was doing, like he did this amazing, um, almost slow, hurt, uh, busted uh, industrial track for Arkin walking into the bar the first time in Collector One. Mm. And then when we had the rights to Depeche Mode, you could kind of see Jerome's eyes go like, I busted my ass on that song, where's it going? I was like, would you mind trying it over the crosscut sequence where mom is being attacked and Josh is, and then it just all of a sudden now that act of the movie had the same rhythm like yeah Depeche Mode doesn't fit here but Jerome fits right here like boom yeah now does music you know a lot about music you you I, I I've known that I've known that from you for a while there and I, I you know especially from what you choose and how you approach music and film why is it important for you as a filmmaker? How much do you think in the terms of, yes, it's music when you're writing the script? Well, I'll, I'll make a playlist before I'm even writing for a tone. So that can be pieces of score. Uh, it can be Led Zeppelin right next to Suzanne Vega. So I kind of like, for whatever reason, when the levee breaks has a nice uh, bass drum sound that works with the hi-hat and blood makes noise and I, you know, they just flow together. Mm. So then what does it sound like? Okay, now maybe I'll, I can depict what it sounds like in terms of the vibe and the characters and the dialogue and kind of working backwards from the effect I, I, that I would hope to have. I'm just geeking yeah. out because you actually mentioned not only Led Zeppelin, but Blood Makes Noise by Susan Vega, which is a, <laughs> one of my favorite songs. <laughs> <laughs> it's a yeah. great song. Nice. <laughs> I, it, it's phenomenal. Yeah, well, like, so, okay, this one in particular screenplay, uh, all I had for the first page was uh, crying won't help you, praying won't do you no good. You know, Led Zeppelin. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then the first time I wrote with Patrick, he, we did the same thing. We're put a quote on one page, I'll put a quote on another page, and we'll see where we end up. So Patrick writes, he who has a why to live can bear with any how. Nietzsche. And then I wrote, if you want blood, you got it. ACDC. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Yeah. And that, and that was Feast. Wow. Perfect. <laughs> Very so, cool, man. I wrote I the dialogue for the ACDC characters, and he wrote <laughs> the story for the, you know, mom is going to save the kid, you know. I, and that, that was fun. That's really cool. Yeah. <laughs> I love the relationship that you guys have. You guys are, like, the perfect combination of, of partners to make these films why why is it so sex successful with him what is it about working with patrick that just works for you it's well you know it, it reminds me of a, of a of a great quote for any partnership is remember should you ever criticize your partner they are the one who settled for you <laughs> mm. <laughs> it's so, a good point okay it oh, starts God. with it starts with really respect and like I know when I get a compliment from him, it feels amazing. And mm -hmm. I would hope that when he gets a compliment from me, it feels amazing. Cause then we're also we're both knives and we're both each other's flintstone. So we to break these things, we're always trying to get sharp, 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 sharp. Then it sparks, boom. And we're like, okay, now we see the same road. And plus we don't uh, you know, I mean knock on wood, we don't fight. We debate like cats fighting over the last mouse, but we mm. don't fight. Mm. Like, it, and, and that's another thing. Like, you can have a way if you can debate. Now you're sharpening your vocabulary. You know, mm. you don't curse. You don't. You don't just do things like that. Like, tell me why. What's the feeling? What am I not seeing? And then 
to also have the uh, the the a nice threshold of honesty and experience to be like wow this one really has me in a corner and i don't know can i call you at a random hour and say i need help on this idea and then you've got this trusted source and that's mm -hmm. really cool so then and also another thing he's got in common with josh you got a friend you got a father you got an amazing husband and all those things those life things look at what that does for characters and sharing we don't have to have the exact same life as another person we're imagining but we each have had life experiences that can make those stories feel a bit more genuine and that that's that's the ultimate you know hopeful olive olive branch to extend to any viewer yeah, that we were kids mm -hmm. we were teens mm -hmm. uh we we both tripped we both run <laughs> it's been it's been fun <laughs> that's awesome now, speaking you. of of your screenplays uh you were a couple years ago handed the reins to one of my favorite horror franchises the saw franchise uh, were you did you feel a sense of responsibility and like a, a bit of terror or did you go into that like i got this oh you know what that, so that'd be saw four like that was pretty amazing we had a we had a unique introduction to even being able to tell stories because we had to do it on camera and so what was nice about that was is i think our first experience and that would be feast and project greenlight is we were on camera so it wasn't like we we were already from small town illinois i was working at a video store and a cubicle at a family fun place and i don't know we just were we were very midwest about anything so you, there wasn't a need and you weren't being prodded to do something for the camera like mm -hmm. this was really that that last little gray area before shock it to me not sock it to me but shock it to me became you know boom if you get wasted and punch somebody you'll get on camera and then you can hawk <laughs> the fitness juice yeah like no <laughs> we wanted it to be like i don't you know i had i had horrible acne as a kid i got into telling stories and holding a camera because i did i was too embarrassed to be in front of one so mm. that experience was really terrifying for me so you know, out comes the hair, out goes the bushy beard, and just wanting to really hide. So it's like, no, 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 I don't want the attention. It's got to be for that movie. I want everybody mm -hmm. to see this movie. I'm not, I'm not nearly as cool as monsters. Like monsters are cool. These cameras, I think, also, advertently and inadvertently, kept everybody on their best behavior. Mm -hmm. So we didn't have a traditional first time. Uh, wow, you know, shady. There was just wasn't much shady about it, and it, and that was nice. It was, I think, it was very balanced and pretty damn cool so then when saw came about it was like i remember exactly what i thought is like my gosh this might even open in more than 50 theaters <laughs> yeah and, and we, that was true, you know? so because it, it was all like my mom can say because like with feast it was like you know my our sons made a movie said the meltons and the dunstans and like what <laughs> it came out for the weekend at midnight on 50 screens. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and then so I was like, okay, with Saw, I wasn't even like, I'll be nervous about Saw later, but my mom can actually say something like, there's the dad, there's the name. Oh, uh, that's great. It's in, it's in my hometown of Macomb. Woohoo! <laughs> and, and plus, we were, uh, we were kind of the only new element in Saw 4, because you had a nice wonderful carryover language and, and mm. the charisma and passion of Darren Bowsman. Like, talk about a guy who was patient teaching us, guiding us and leading that. And at the same time, he was working on his passion project, Repo. Huh? So you, we saw four had a beautiful sets, uh, like the mausoleum set for the opening mm. uh, was awesome, but also could serve double purpose for Repo, you know, when it had another set. So it was, it was neat to see. I like seeing an artist on, on full, like full go for it. And, and, and Darren like just so, man, while, while with his uh, lovely pup Chance and, and his wife, you know, and everything, it was, it was cool. We felt like, like guests in, in, in the best way possible. Like we were, we felt welcome. And mm -hmm. then that allowed us to push and push in every direction possible, push the adrenaline, push the action, push the, just push the stimulus and try to earn that doggone twist ending that we did not come up with that twist ending. I want to give that credit to I think Peter Block mm. came up with what if it was taking place at the same time as three. Yeah. And I felt like cool. for once, a twist that could only be told in a sequel. Mm -hmm. Like you couldn't do that in the first one. This takes place at the same time as a movie you haven't seen yet. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but in Saw 4, I was like, 
whoa! I mean, it's, it was a clever answer to a simple riddle. How can you still be alive? And Darren went all in on the, you know, well, his head's off now. Now his brain's out of his head. Yeah. Now he's like, he's clear, he's so dead. I don't think anyone's been more dead than this guy. But am I? <laughs> <laughs> That must have opened your world because, again, you're not only are you opening in more than 50 theaters, you're opening huge. Those movies mm -hmm. were, for that time, massive. Oh, yeah. Did, what kind of doors did that open for you, and, and how easily did you jump into The Collector from that? Uh, I read an article in Premier Magazine, which, you know, ages me up some. Uh, A little Premier bit. Yeah, we remember it. <laughs> well, I, and I remember reading about Randall Wallace, you know, who wrote Braveheart. He, he was interviewed and he was like, well, I understood that if I could get three movies made that I've written, that maybe they'd allow me to direct one. And then that ended up being, we were soldiers once and young. Mm -hmm. right? So I thought, oh, well, that's it. Maybe we'll get three movies made and I can do it. And then sure enough, Feast was out one year, Saw 4 the next, Saw 2 and 3, or uh, Feast 2 and 3 were shooting while Saw 5 was prepping. And then in between the two, bam, I was able to get in there and make this little thing called The Collector. Wow. Very good. And so then uh, my my vacation, you know, which who wants, I, I don't want a vacation from making movies. Like, keep me in there. I love that. Um, <laughs> my vacation was uh, wrapped, uh, the collector flew up and spent a couple weeks on Saw 5 and then went back into editing and then got ready for Saw 6 and then boom. And then the collection came between those and then bang, on to Saw 7. I really think that was, yeah, it, 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 was, it was so fun. Living, living in a creation mm. it's been cast it's being made it's not that it, it, a sometimes lonely relationship with paper that you hope will exist in another form no nope. that thing you just wrote well now it's a set <laughs> you could kind of be like wow this is neat you felt like you were protecting something and that was cool um the one i'm really really proud of is saw six mm. and, mm. It, and it, yes. was the most con it was the most confusing experience I've, i'm sure for the canadians because they were shot in Canada and it's all about healthcare. And so like, <laughs> that was the one where they were like, I don't know what the, you know, what are you guys talking about? It's like, yeah. well, America, you don't, you don't get healthcare. Mm, you get yeah. healthcare. <laughs> Dramatic coffee <laughs> sip here. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. and that I, movie, yeah, that is one of my favorite. I think it's one of the best sequels by far. Oh yeah, that, that franchise was like so formative for me as like transitioning into kind of more hardcore horror when the first Saw came out and riding that franchise out through college. And like, it's one of the reasons I'm so messed up. So thank you. No, <laughs> <laughs> but six was the chance to say a, a, a little bigger message, you mm -hmm. know, a little something mm. that it could talk out a bit. Whereas five had there were 20 pages of the saw five screenplay that didn't make it uh, they just were cut out along the way and i think that's a shame because i really did enjoy what it did i and i i might be misremembering so i don't want to be dragged across the coals but there was it was going to tie up in this really cool way with two. Oh, and it was we're listening to the game that triggers the fire alarm that Danny Glover hears in the background to figure out where he was. So it was going to be like, wow, like, uh. oh, and you're like, are you kidding me? Oh, I, wow. But I want to say there was something where it might have been the utterance of, you know, could they afford to bring Mr. Glover back or was it possible timing or whatnot that I just genuinely hooked me up to a lie detector. I don't recall because I was shooting. So mm -hmm. I don't Fair enough. Um, but I remember that was the idea is it, like we wanted to capitalize on what was so cool about the zing ending of four and then give it to two and then six we were pretty happy with where it was going to go forward. Mm. Uh, there you go. Were there any uh, in insane jigsaw kills that you wrote or conceptualized that never saw the light of day through this franchise? Well, there was one. I did not come up with this one, but man, I want to give this one again to Peter Block. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and And the idea was... Ever remember that phrase, chew the fat? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> well, when I looked it up and its origin about like, we're going to settle our dispute, let's go chew the fat. So this was to have to tie into a particular character. So maybe it was the Bobby Dagan character, how it was all breaking this, this, this loyal tribe of liars that were going to make a superstar that they could control out of the jigsaw method. And Bobby Dagan was going to be the Tony Robbins of this philosophy. Let's get in, get out before anyone catches us, make a mint, we're set. And it was to be like the the a subtle hint on the look at me, you know, culture. Mm -hmm. the, mm. shock it. 
you know? Um, so, the one, he was going to walk into a room, <laughs> and the publicist was going to publicize the lie, and the, I want to say the person, the image person, maybe it could have been, a, in this point, a lawyer or a photographer or someone, it's one where the fat is being suctioned out of the one going into a tube of the other's mouth, oh. and it's can hang on and keep the scale balanced of justice. Oh. It's just Bobby, and then you'd be like, oh, oh, man. Oh, 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 that's crazy. Yeah, that and and that that I think uh, that didn't make it past the uh, well, even mid pitch, like you know, response. <laughs> Great idea. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Yeah. I mean, you, you know what the thing is. I want to actually, you did bring it up, and I want to jump into Feast a little bit too mm -hmm. because those movies are a lot of fun, and I think they're like you said, they they open small, but they they developed a bit of a cult following. You know, obviously, you kind of took a lot of chances. You got you guys got sick in those movies. Jesus <laughs> Christ! <laughs> what, how do you feel about the you know what the, the you know the kind of cult cult phenom that happened with those films? Well. It was a, uh, and it's just a point of observation. So, like, you want, I, I watched every monster movie. Hence, you know, the Boogans watching all of, all of them, and you start to see the tropes: who dies first, who dies last, and you're like, huh, huh, huh. Let's make a movie about all the first victims being abandoned in a town, and then all of a sudden the characters were more interesting. So the adulterer has just as much of a chance as making it as the felon, as the biker, as the, and then. I was like, wow, because I, you know, I remember feeling like, dude, it, I'm not the quarterback. They're not going to save me. And I got to save the AV club first. They're going <laughs> to save them, right? So they're like, oh, it's going to be up to me. So then it, you're like, it, you like, you find the, the, the bumper sticker wit of folks that are already in a corner. And it's almost like the, the whole lifetime they've been shoved in a corner by a circumstance, poverty, bullying has been their training for when a monster shows up and all the other folks go, ah, and become food. They're like, this is just another day, man. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <sighs> that was the philosophy. So then in terms of then flipping the scenes, it was nice to tee up an absolute trope. So Robert Rodriguez gave express permission for Feast to be made because the setup is no different than minute 35 of From Dust Till Dawn. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Characters That's, walk yeah. into a bar. The bar is attacked by monsters. Mm -hmm. And so being very cognizant of that and a, a huge ardent of From Dust Till Dawn, it was, it was really nice because then that's how we met him. That's how we met Mr. Tarantino was at. And they knew what movie we were talking about, like legitimately. It was, like, it was really cool. So it, was, it wasn't any longer than a handshake, but that handshake meant a lot. Oh, wow. It meant that it was okay to poke fun at trope flips because they had done it beautifully. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, our, yeah, if anyone's going to understand it. Yeah, well, be my, them. our script for Feast 2 uh, earned us the spot to ghostwrite on Piranha 3D for a little while, like a pass. I think the, a couple of things that made it into the movie was the kid wears a Pixies t-shirt because I wanted him to be a Pixies fan, you know? That's cool. <laughs> right? I, I like the idea of the cool kid who's not cool but is cool because he lives listening to is she weird? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I dug that. And so, but I, I wish John Gulliger would have been given the, the budget to just make Feast 2 because ultimately what happened was Feast 2 was stretched and chopped in half for 2 and 3. So 3's never been made. And 3 is... 3 is awesome. <laughs> yeah, I agree. <laughs> it really was because... We were, uh, it was supposed to be a torch handoff to kind of subgenres within monster movies. So the first one, very contained, ends with, well, where do we go now? Second one was going to, the ending of two originally was our characters are kind of in a, in a pretty screwed position, but they figured out a way to lay waste to some of these creatures enough. They can still attack. And then we're like, you know, you see them in the daylight, they ain't as scary. And that's when the scarier thing shows up. And our big beast would, would suddenly just crouch down and you see a metal hand come from like a cover of Heavy Metal Magazine and you see it's got a leash. <laughs> and that was going to be the intro to, <laughs> oh, now they're going to rip on the alien invasion tropes. And then that's three. <laughs> nice. Like Three is like, wow, the dogs of war were the creatures. Yep. And now here comes 
the now we can go into the thing and now we can go into uh the day the earth stood still and start to make fun of how elegant aliens are at the start and then they always dissolve into just gooey spindly piles like oh you know like i want to kill it but it's gross <laughs> very cool yeah that was fun and then i That's yeah we, yeah we, then we we're getting into the whole classism thing too where the end at three is literally feast three mm -hmm. one segment in black and white and it's atomic and it's the first signal from another being and like we need to prepare for this boom and that that, that cast is killed off well why is that a secret then two is the 20 minutes left of two of those characters in that period mm -hmm. and, and three is in the distant future and the fantasy was uh sage stallone sylvester stallone's son mm -hmm. was going to be playing a i think he had a baseball bat a dirt bike and by this point you hear like it's okay it's safe come on out and this kid in the woods in the distant apocalyptic future with this bat sees all these mannequins and the, that the aliens have set up to look like people to be like, it's okay, come on out. <laughs> okay. So it's the reverse, like how we hunt for deer by putting out a giant plastic thing that doesn't yeah. even make a sound. Like I keep thinking from the deer's point of view, how confounding is that? <laughs> like, like come on. what are you doing, dude? There's hunters here in the <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> we were doing that but it was gonna be sage stallone with this bat like that just tells me one of them's nearby and then mm -hmm. boom he doesn't mind getting dirty and where does he end up hiding in the bunker we saw explode that is still underground and he finds the last of the weapons from the characters in the second timeline and then he's able to put out one last middle finger from earth bam the bumper sticker sends the alien force back <laughs> Sweet. oh my god amazing I used to just not say a doggone thing about any of these movies, but in terms of Zoom's podcast and a straight up pandemic making us into our own bunker residence, it's 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 like therapy now. Like, yeah. hey, here's what it could have been. I, I I sincerely apologize to anyone who felt ripped off or time wasted or just didn't care for some of these movies, but every time we did our damnedest to do our best. Yeah, <laughs> that's all you I can do. I remember you talking about it before, like vaguely, and I was like, I got so excited because I was a fan, and I'm right. like, and it, it's it's, but I like the fact what I like about you and and Patrick is that you guys have this kind of way of expanding the horror, and you don't just stick with the your you don't just go the safe route. You never do, mm. and I I, I want to jump back on Saw Six a little bit because it's a very relevant film today. Very yeah. relevant. And I, I, I remember seeing that for the first time and thinking, yeah, good, good. <laughs> I thought that was the one we were going to get fired because we were actually given an outline of, uh, to do, and we didn't. We threw really? it out. Really? <laughs> and um, we didn't throw it out, like, you know, with, 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 uh, with arrogance. We were like, mm. hey, we're... You know, Kevin Groider and we, we, we kind of want to make a movie about Edward Norton's character from Fight Club if he wasn't a split personality, but actually was forced to take responsibility for the math he does. Mm -hmm. And then, okay, try it out. And then sure enough, the outline was, a, okay, now write that. You know, so it that that allowed it to work. Oh, wow. And because it, it was before it was going to be a mafia, like type thing or mafia kidnaps somebody and once you know they end up kidnapping like a zap and then huh. the zap is drawn in the jigsaw so that could have been fine too but it, it but it, that felt more like a movie story whereas this was like what is the twilight zone what is you know like rod serling wanted to tell you a story about the criminality of not having universal health care mm -hmm. he wasn't allowed to do that but he could make any horror movie he wanted so he made a horror movie about a guy who dealt with the math and the, you know like that <laughs> And that's, you know, that's a rich tradition in horror is a little bit of social commentary mixed in with the gore. I mean, all the way back to, you know, Romero doing, you know, uh, con uh, consumerism for Day yeah. of the Dead or, you know. Or, or even um, going back. I mean, if you look at Frankenstein, if you go look at those movies, the Universal Monsters. Sure. There was, there was things to be said. Yeah. And genre allows that. Exactly. Which a, a lot of films don't. What, you can't, would, what would you say, if I may, sorry. Go yeah, no, no, fire. Yeah. What would you say is the commentary of Frankenstein? This is a very loaded question. Well, I mean, here's my thing is like Frankenstein is quote unquote Frankenstein's monster is this 
guy that we create. It's it's almost a play on, well, you know, we create things that we are out of our hands. We have no control. We play God. We do all this shit. And then we create this wonderful thing that could be a beautiful thing. He's a beautiful fucking monster, yet yeah, we disregard him because... Him. Oh, look at him. Yeah. Yeah. We, we disregard the dude because he he's not what we wanted. And and I think that's like, you know, it, of course we turn on the guy that's really not the problem. He's not the issue. Frankenstein's monster was never the issue. It's this psycho, ego-driven asshole that, you know, basically creates this thing and you know i i it's it's a fascinating thing because you're like yeah it's uh, that kind of mentality that we have today that oh oh wait someone did something oh well let's get our pitchforks out let's go after them because we don't know the circumstances we're just going to go after them because mm -hmm. we you know we figure that's the thing to do that's a very layman's dumbass way to explain <laughs> it but you know <laughs> you got it man yeah i appreciate that and and, and ryan Oh dear. Um, <laughs> see, I've I've always viewed that movie as more through. I mean, I he's my favorite. I have a portrait on my wall painted by Rick Baker of Frankenstein's monster. Like it's he's always been my favorite Universal monster, and I've always viewed it as a bad parenting movie, where he you know he creates this thing out of passion, and it's not what he wanted it to be. So he casts it out and he kicks it to the curb, and what happens? It goes off and it rampages and. You know, there's that, uh, what was that quote that I saw? Something along the lines of, like, the average man knows that Frankenstein is not the name of the monster. The thinking man knows that it is. Because, oh. like, Dr. Frankenstein really is the, the true monster of it all. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's about being a bad, you know, turning on your, your own intentions, I suppose. I love that you both brought up similar yet very distinct points of view to that. Which I think that's... That's the totem of a great oh, it's awesome. beautiful monster that can mean anything to us. Not I was I was him for Halloween this year. The, oh, that's awesome. We did uh, we did COVID friendly Frankenstein costumes where we made like leather harnesses and, and we did like <laughs> Frankenstein and Bride of Frankenstein. Our dog was the doctor. Like, yeah, I, I'm all about the, the Frankenstein mythology. It's great. He that is. is Fantastic. Wow. So what would be uh, Frankenstein having been mentioned? Is there a universal character, universal horror movie character that you guys would like to see brought back. Mm, I love the idea because I'm a, I'm such a water guy. I would love to see the creature from Black, Black Lagoon. And I know that it's being talked about. I don't know where we are in stages yet, but I would love to see that character come back. I think that that's definitely primed for it. I, I think I want to go a little bit more out of right field. Like, let's get a genuinely creepy dark version of the Phantom of the Opera. Ooh, like, we, yeah. we have, you know, we have the musical, and the musical's great, oh. but, like, he, everyone forgets the Phantom was a universal monster. Like, we can get mm -hmm. real dark with that story. That book's messed up. Like, I would like to see a modern take on that, personally. I'm trying to think, did you, uh, did you see the Robert England version of that? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's technically been done, but it would be interesting to see what they would do now. I guess through through the lens of like what they just did with like Invisible Man, kind of a modern mm. telling of that. What about uh, you, Marcus? Well, I mean, my answer to that one's easy because they're doing it. Lee Winnell doing the Wolfman. Yes, that's dope. Because what I, I what I have seen in the Wolfman, but haven't quite seen yet, is it came closest maybe in Wolf, the the Jack Nicholson one. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Saw how it could complement and enhance the everyday life, but what I haven't haven't quite seen yet is how I think it's a great metaphor for alcoholism, mm -hmm. rage, mm -hmm. uh, and I think wouldn't that be timely to show the things like when you've got a country divided almost down the middle, and the only thing keeping that thing vibrating from turning into an all-out rageathon is a tenuous chat with ourselves and every interaction like understanding empathy and whatnot and the thing about the wolfman kind of like jekyll and hyde which maybe this could play to jekyll and hyde is like the wolfman is like it is so separated in this person that it's cleanly divided there is black outrage feral and then i'm sure the other person is the best friend the best parents 
the like the most understanding, empathetic thing. And so mm. like, it's realizing I may have to put myself down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know if that happened. Yeah. Whoa. Can you guys hang on one second? And mm. then I'll, I'll, I want to show you the teaser. Oh, oh my God. That'd be hell amazing. yeah. Yeah. Oh. Dude, the goal was to create the feeling when we were kids and saw Friday the 13th part four the first mm. time. And mm. I was like, hey, this one's a little spookier. Like, ah, you know? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I love it. Oh, I'm, I'm so in. Oh, my God. Uh, <laughs> I need to see that now. <laughs> only eight days of shooting, but we got a lot of stuff. So That's that, great, wow. man. Well, I'm looking forward to that for sure. I can't wait to unleash it because I think like, if we, you know, sell it in the right way of just like, this is the one that's NC-17 and earns the NC-17 going all the way back to Showgirls. You went to the <laughs> NC-17 Showgirls to feel like you were part of an adult experience. It doesn't matter if you're man, woman, whatnot, but adults only, this is going to respect your age range. That's what we want to do with this sucker. Sick. <laughs> you know, I want to ask you because we're, we're I want to ask you about a couple of things that you have in the uh, up and coming that mm -hmm. are, you know, that's on your uh, on your plate. Because you got I was looking at all the things you're about to work on. God of War. God of War. I don't know if that'll ever happen because the rights lapsed on it. But hey, we we finished the screenplay. That must be kind of frustrating, though, because it seems like that. How often does that happen? You'd be surprised how often. Mm. Like that was down to casting um, and discussing casting and and like, hey, if it's rated R, it has to come in at this price point. So change the uh, any scene dealing with big time water to sand because sand is budget friendly. However, if you want to do PG-13, it can be water and a little more expensive. But like, nah, if you're making a movie about someone covered in the ashes of his child and wife with swords welded to his hands, you know, you're like, that be or chained to his hands, that feels like it should be a rated R mm -hmm. John Milius story, you know? Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, it's just, it, I, I, boy, I hope it comes back. That would be great. I hope, so it, too. That, I hope so too. That's prime for a movie. But like, then again, those games are dope. Something beautiful with the games where now it's a father son story, too. So mm -hmm. I can see if, like, the God of War super budget limited series could take you through all of that. And then end with Unforgiven, which is where we were kind of coming in. Mm. Mm. An Unforgiven story. Okay. Well, and you, now you have a you have the ability, Marcus, to dump jump into well-established franchise as well as creating your own. You're also jumping into Final Destination. Yeah. Good lord! I, you would have thought that it would be a little bit uh, easier to report on that one because like get this first responders final destination yeah the people on the front lines of death all the time now being pursued by it on every angle mm. it's been pretty easy to me and then uh well i'm sure as the trades have told you things seem to be a little uh up in the air yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. that because it is it, i will say this it's a big price tag so mm. It's got to have the the sexiest filmmaker, uh, and it's it's got to. It also, I think, has to earn folks to keep going on the journey because Five was awesome. Oh, Five, five was, was great. great. That yeah. Where, uh, Talk about a good twist. Yeah, where we've had some luck with our sixes of the past. No, you know, we wanted this six to feel like a its own one. Mm. Uh, but then the whole angle on. Just first responders really seemed like it would work. And this was before anything pandemic related. So it's frustrating when you're like, you guys could have been ahead of a giant curve. But oh hey, my God. I'm, I'm sure, you know, I'm sure it's whatever they're doing is brilliant. <laughs> oh. Well, I mean, you're like the perfect person to take that over too. I am. Well, but at the same time, you gotta like, I wish I could be catty, a, a bit more catty, but. But no, that wouldn't be wise. I mean, folks are figuring out what the terrain of entertainment is right now. Who'd have thought we could see Wonder Woman 84 at home, you know, and right. Zack Schneider's Justice League. And this has created a different modus operandi. So oh, I don't definitely. It, it, I, I mean, at a baseline, it's not safe enough to make that movie. Though. It just isn't. Yeah, yeah. totally fair. It's going to be a while the, before that. 
I because I because I want that I, I want spectacle back. I, I didn't find myself going to watch movies that take place in Zoom. I watched. I was in outer space. I was watching sports movies. I was yeah. watching. You know. Uh, uh, Gosh, what was the one I went? The Natural. Kept watching that. Um, Moneyball, uh, mm -hmm. Hoosiers. You know, just anything. Major League. Like, yeah, got it. Oh, so you're a big yeah. baseball guy, huh? Uh, I can't play it for a lick, but I love sports movies, especially right. when a sports movie is actually about something else than the sport. What's your mm -hmm. team, man? I gotta, I gotta know. Oh well, I'm a Chicago person, so that'd be the Cubs. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> there you go. Right on. Red, Red Sox over here. Respect okay. all. Respect to the Cubs. Another cursed team that finally saw their World Series. I, I was rooting for y'all. Absolutely. Oh, that could not believe it. I had a friend who was so stressed out watching that game seven mm -hmm. that he left where we were watching it. And then the rain happened. <laughs> and so then he's like, so? No one's saying anything. So, so nothing happened. It started raining. Went, what? Came home and <laughs> drove back to see the game then as they pull the tarps back and they play like, it just could, it, the the world was on a needle point. Oh, it yeah. just was so fun. Every, like, everyone oh. was pulling for the Cubs that year. Yeah, and it would seem like if bad luck was ever put to the test, it was mm -hmm. that night. Like we're gonna give you the greatest win ever by dangling it, dangling it, dangling yeah. it. Bam! <laughs> <laughs> that was yeah. Well, now, Marcus, I had mentioned to you uh, when we talked that we, if you had a horror story or a ghost story, and you do have something for us, apparently. There'll be food and drink and ghosts, and perhaps even a few murders. You're all invited. Josh Stewart has a doozy. Oh. Um, I, 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 I will not repeat his story. That's for him to tell. Fair enough. But I will say, when we were kids, and my parents, we would stay in this uh, cabin in, uh, in the woods of Grand Rapids, Minnesota, on a, on a lake, uh, Lake Pekegma. And this cabin was uh, rumored to have been built with mostly repurposed, AKA probably stolen uh, parts from the, the railroad construction and whatnot going on. And it was a patchwork of, of different eras, different, different genres of wood, if you will, all kind of hodgepodge together into this house that nothing was quite smooth, nothing was quite straight. And yet it was wonderful for its own thing. And my one time I heard my, my father and my sister talking and about a ghost. And they didn't want to scare me. Like they didn't want to read it, but they, my sister and father, they, they helped me get into horror by sharing the blanket and the popcorn and cold check the Night Stalker was, was my oh, gateway. Nice. So then this, but this one wasn't on the TV. This was happening in the living room. And all the lights were out and like, I think he's here. And they were saying the name of the person who built the house. Like, do you smell that? I know he smoked a pipe. Like, it smells like a pipe right here. You know, like, and so were we supposed to be scared? Were we, or was he just letting us know that he was there or something like that? And so then I, I, I however, was putting on a bit more of a suspect cap and I went to where they smelled it. And it was this old fashioned light switch that you turn and you hear a snap and then the light would come on. I'm like, hmm. And I did not smell the pipe, but I was fascinated with the light switch. So then as this place was ultimately going to be raised and replaced with another structure that was, uh, that could be a full year round structure, I realized that what was in the walls where this person was letting us know he was there was all this old newspaper and all these vintage headlines surrounding these wires as if when he would expire, so would the next person. Cause every time you turn that light switch, it spit a little spark at the old headlines. And so what they were smelling, I believe was not this man's pipe, but a little bit of the past hmm. almost coming out to take us all out. <laughs> oh, <my God. laughs> oh man, dodged a bullet there. Yeah, yeah. That, that one was great. That would, that would creep me out. Yeah. Was, yeah. So I was like, Maybe it's a ghost, maybe it's a warning, maybe it's both. Mm. It, oh. Interesting. <laughs> Beware uh, the pipe. Can I tell you the scariest thing that happened to me during uh, the first shutdown? Please. Please. I love working in horror movies. I must say it doesn't always mean I want to be scared to death. <laughs> yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah, I get that. Um, I, I like to take quarantine to just, you know, it's a lot of stuff. I, I, I was in a war with... Uh, 
uh, moisture and old cardboard. So I was going to get rid of all the cardboard and like just the things that we let stack up through life and either chuck it or put it in a, a sealed plastic container of some sort. Well, on the night I was going to make my most trips into the uh, recycling bin and the trash bin, I was cranking a particular Nine Inch Nails heavy playlist. And, and so it was like, boom, boom, boom. And yeah, it didn't matter that it was 10, you know, going on 11, then it was midnight. I was still breaking down cardboard and making trips into the garage. Well, when you open up the garage, it goes like so, and it has a light that stays on for approximately three minutes. So I had about nine trips worth of stuff to go in and out. And now it was 2.30 in the morning. And on the first shutdown, everything had to be closed. Everyone had to be off the street um, by, I think it was, you know, what, midnight or so? Like nothing was open. Mm-hmm. I think it was 10. I think it was actually earlier than that. Yeah. Oh, okay. Right on. So it's 2.30. And I am going up and down the stairs. Trip one, trip two, the light's still on in the garage. Trip three, trip four, still on. Trip five, light goes out. Trip six, trip seven, trip eight, trip nine, someone's in the garage. And it's this person dressed all in black with a black trench coat. And his back is to me like this in the garage. And as soon as I go in and I make a sound, he just turns and smiles. Uh. And he goes, you have a cigarette? And I'm holding styrofoam and cardboard. And I went, I don't smoke, I'm fat. That's all I could think of saying. And so then his hand's out, and he's still smiling. He goes, did you just say you don't smoke, you're fat? I went, yep. Idiot. Haven't heard that one. And backed into the dark. <laughs> <laughs> what, what movie did that guy walk in oh from? Have, what is that? I have no idea. I have no idea. So That's I wild. ran it, I ran my chunky ass back up the steps, and I looked out at... Guy was gone. Wow. Eesh. That's creepy. That's insane. There were a lot of other, like, just the details, like the perfect smile. It was just, it was Patrick Bateman. We're going to see that guy in one of your scripts someday, aren't we? I think so. (laughs) I hope so. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That's wild, man. Well, well, there it is. I can't top that. I know. That's that's like one of the best stories we've heard. That's that's freaky. (laughs) I did have one more question if we don't, before we wrap it up. Because, all right, so like, I would be hard plus if I didn't talk about, I keep it on my coffee table. Like, I love the scary stories books. Oh, hey, right Like, you had a hand in that movie and I thought that movie really captured the spirit of the book so well. So I wanted to talk a little bit about scary stories. Yeah. We're, we're absolutely grateful to uh, share a screen credit with the Hagmans, with, uh, with Guillermo, with, and then beautifully directed. So like, good. Holy it was cow. so good. When I saw the, the autopsy of Jane Doe, they're like, uh oh, this guy's, this guy's going places. And man, did he deliver in that movie. And I really loved what they did with the big toe. So mm-hmm. that, that, because it, it scared the yeah. heck out of me. You know, I, that's wonderful. Uh, and ultimately, the greatest thing about that, to almost speed right through it, is. I was with my mom, my sister, sitting next to Patrick, two of his children, and Guillermo del Toro said our names. Ooh. Oh. That was it. Yeah. And then, okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> and, and, and so, it, it, that was the, the absolute closest to a feeling of holding that book the first time turning a page and having this art open up a new world mm. and having this story open up a new door up here. And then, and I, I felt like I was being allowed into a secret club of imagination. Yeah. And then to just, I mean, man, I, 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 Mr. Del Toro, if you're out there, when you say someone's name, they, they feel seen and they feel loved. You guys really nailed it. Like, you really did. You. Well, I, 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 we, man, and that was the thing, like, the brothers Hagman and Patrick and I, I don't think they ever read what we did, and we never read what they did, it just, both of what we did ended up sharing the same story, so it was a, it was a victory of, uh, 
of just being on totally different paths at one point, but then they helixed in when everything came out, you know, in that way. So the, the Writers Guild actually decides who gets those credits. Mm. We just, we bring our paper in. And so that meant a lot. And we did have some things, but ours wasn't set in the 60s. We were in the 80s. Okay. And then yeah. it came out and Stranger Things came out. We're like, well, that's probably going to go the way of the dodo. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, absolutely. It, it, but uh, it, it's a power to those stories that they still, uh, you, you can put them in any decade. And, mm-hmm. and as long as you, and what I love that the, the Hagmans did is they, those kids felt a little closer to the way I did. Like they, there wasn't, uh, I, I know, I, 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 I liked seeing glasses. I liked seeing hair that was a little messy. Yeah. I even liked the, the, the bully, you know, the bully guy had, he had some humanity to him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And oh my gosh, I never thought you could get away with pitchforking a kid in a uh-huh. movie. And like, whoa! And it was PG-13! PG-13, yes! <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, are you? Wow! Yeah. And then, you know, the pale lady's pretty much a giant naked person suffocating a little kid. Like, yeah. wow! You know? <laughs> I mean, y'all captured the, the artwork, like, just the nightmarish style mm-hmm. of that artwork in film so well. But the thing I thought was remarkable, and, and the, the Hagmans told me this, was the pale lady was all mm-hmm. practical. Norman Cabrera. And, I mean, jeez Louise, that, yeah. that's, that was stunning. That was absolutely stunning. I, and I, I loved that. Just that there was the, mm, and the odd right. smile. Oh, so well done. Mm-hmm. I just Honestly. wanted to applaud you guys. I was, I was a big fan of what you did with that. I agree. Well, thank, I agree. Thank you. In this case, I think that the best answer is we are honored to be a part of that. We, we were part of its process, and it was six years. Have you ever, ever remember these? Oh, no. man. I don't think I've picked that one up. Okay. What do we got? Well, maybe you'll find out in 2020 fun. Ooh. Uh, okay. <laughs> oh, tease. Drop it. Okay. A little bit. I see you. <laughs> oh man, Marcus, man, you're the you are the best. You really are. It's been you're... great talking to you. Oh, hey, thank you for, for thank you for your joy and your camaraderie and yeah, it's it's the the best thing. And James, thank you for inspiring me. Like I wouldn't, I, there would be more of here yeah. if it wasn't for you. And I'm grateful for what's here because oh. it was fight. So thanks for being the thanks for being what I looked up to on my climb. <laughs>